Hello, today I have a pleasure to talk to Federico Fernandez from Argentina, but you live in Poland. Some time of the year at least, yeah. <laughs> yes, some time of the year. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you live permanently in Poland or just you come here for, for some tasks? No, I, I, I travel a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm here also quite mm -hmm. a good but part of the year. May we say that you left Argentina? Yeah, yeah I have left Argentina almost 11 years ago. Why? What was the reason? Oh, the reason was that it was a complicated country. Argentina? Yeah. Why? Can you explain a little bit? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could be talking about this all, all, all night. Um, Argentina for a very long time has had a lot of problems, both social and economical, uh, inflation, uncertainty. So, yeah, that made it... Uh, I am one of many who have left Argentina because of that. Because of that. And you uh, find your, uh, may we say, that new, new homeland in Poland? Yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. To a yeah. certain extent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so can you say, because uh, you are a libertarian. Yes. And so it started in Argentina or when you came here to Poland? No, I started in Argentina. Yes? yes. And can you say a little bit about the libertarians in, in uh, Argentina? Yes, of course. Uh, Argent uh, probably because of all the problems <laughs> that Argentina uh, has had, particularly economic problems, the, the libertarians, the classical liberal libertarian scene, however you want to call it, is, is quite vibrant. I mean, and well, now, now we can see the results of that. But uh, for, a, for a very long time, Argentina has had a, a lot of particularly very good economists, but also social scientists, philosophers, who were of the classical liberal tradition. And in time, the, the knowledge of that people also uh, grew. Uh, maybe 40, 50 years ago, this was like a very small group, even though, for instance, people like Mises and Hayek were in Argentina giving lectures. Um, was for, but this was a very limited group, but this, this uh, grew a lot and, and, and for a long time, even before Javier Milei, Argentina had a classical liberal public intellectuals, people who were known besides the libertarian bubble, that you know, nor normal people, so to speak, knew that they were consulted by media, that they wrote books that became bestsellers and things like that. So. There has been a, quite a tradition of, of libertarian thinking in the country. Okay, uh, how it started with Millet? Do you, uh, do you know this, this process? What do you mean exactly? How Millet... So, you know, he appeared when he uh, appeared the first and uh, who, <laughs> what he did to become the president, I mean, to be famous, because, because uh, if you are not famous, you, you cannot be elected. <laughs> you have to have name, name recognition, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Aya, please, I take this with a grain of salt, uh, and I, had, I only can tell you some bits and pieces, but if I remember correctly, the first appearance of, of Javier Millet in media was in 2016, or 15, maybe. Uh, and uh, his media appearances definitely helped him to, to gain relevance and, and become more and more prominent. Argentina... Uh, now I think it's changing, but let's say the, the, the culture, particularly media, things like that, were very much statist, very much leftist. And Millet was definitely a voice that uh, was ag against all that. And he was basically thrown into the lions because it was Millet against four or five either economists or politicians who were all leftists, who were calling him names, who were uh, telling him that he wanted the poor to be poorer and, and things like that. So he was very clever in the sense that if he would have, if, had he been talking as we are talking right now, he would have been completely unnoticed. Unknown, yeah. Uh, so he, he was very, he has of course the hair, he has a, a certain looks, and also he was very much in your face. He was very, 
uh, almost outrageous in how he communicated, but he also he was also very very clear. And what happened? These media appearances were then cut by basically young guys and put in social media, and they became viral and more viral and more viral. That's how he started getting into into the people. Because of this, you know, he was shouting, he was saying these things that, you know, for, for traditional media were outrageous. But there were a lot of people who were eager to listen to these things because they were desperate to find a solution. Because Argentina has had for decades now one of the largest states in the world, one of the most interventionist states in the world. And the country is poorer and poorer. Every year is, is worse than the year before. Many people have left. Many families have been broken because of this, because the children are leaving, people who cannot see their grandchildren because their children left, and things like that. So uh, there was the need for, for, an, for, for a different solution, because the, the, the establishment was offering different degrees of basically the same uh, product. Okay, they, they just, you know, make the impression they change some camouflage and uh, they do the same. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. 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 So Millet was elected by 60% of votes. And, a little uh, bit less than that, uh, 54, 55. 54. Yeah, okay, but majority, yeah, 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 in yeah. general by majority. Uh, uh, <clears throat> what do you think, uh, that uh, mentality of Argentinian change, or every Argentinian, every of his voters were poor, were so poor that he decided to finally try something else than, the, than uh, to vote for statists? Yeah, and this is a very good question, and I need you to give me two minutes to try to, to reply to you, uh, because I think it's the most important question, really, to understand uh, what, what's going on with Millet and, and why he won. This is, to me, this is the key question that tells you what the, the future of the country will be, because you can explain the vote to Millet as a people who are upset, people who say, hey, we want, you know, we want somebody to break everything because we are just upset and fed up with the situation. And uh, this guy sounds crazy enough, you know, to, to do that. So we're voting for this guy. He has a crazy hair. And, you know, he used to... Sure, mate, loco. <laughs> exactly. He used to swear in television. So, yeah, he must be crazy enough. Let's vote for you guys. This is... One way to interpret what happened to in Argentina six months ago and why Millet won the election. This is still, I think, the um, most prevailing explanation about why Millet won. Even in Argentina, but no, even in, in, in media in Argentina. Uh, outside of Argentina, definitely. Uh, I think this is a completely wrong narrative. I think the, what explains uh, why Millet won is the following. Argentina has had, has had decades of a, a, a very a mega state, in, in, basically present everywhere, failing everywhere, and with people who were, uh, let's say, uh, fooled for a very long time, but you cannot fool everybody all the time. And that is exactly what happened. And particularly now, thanks to technologies, thanks to social media, thanks to cell phones, you can see how life is in the rest of the world. I, we, I can tell you, oh yeah, Argentina is the best country of the world, we have this, we have that eventually you find out what the what the reality is and argentina has 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 gone through such a steep decadence that even compared to our neighbors argentina argentina used to be a, a richer country than, than than other countries in latin america that is not the case anymore so it's not that you compare to, to Switzerland or to the U.S., oh, yeah, we're not doing that well. No, compared to Paraguay, to Uruguay, to Chile, Argentina is, is doing Bolivia, hard. Even Bolivia? Well, depending, <laughs> okay, depending yeah. how we measure. Depending yeah. on what you measure, yeah, yeah. But uh, the, the situation is, is definitely appalling. And these people were, particularly young people, realized that 
the promises of a, a present state, a state that was going, like a state, you know, that is some sort of, of providential entity, was completely fake, was empty, and had already condemned their grandparents and their parents to poverty. Because young people started noticing that, oh yeah, we, we might have all these, you know, subsidies, but we are still there poor. This is, my, my father lives worse than my, my grandfather used to live, and I'm going to live worse than my father and my mother if, if this continues. And they started looking for alternatives, and they found a, like a, in a way, if you allow me to use the word, like a prophet of the anti-state in Javier Milei. And they started looking up uh, their, their ideas. The vote for Millet was the most reasoned out vote that you could find in Argentina in a very long time, and by far the most reasoned out vote for, of all the votes that happened in the last election. And these young people, by the way, convinced their parents to vote for Millet. So, I think the Millet uh, the Millet's triumph in the last uh, presidential elections is not like a blip, is not uh, uh, something like, oh, well, we want to burn everything so we're voting for this guy. No, it, it shows a very profound transformation. And this, this process has been going on for, for quite some time now. People are fed up with Peronism, people are fed, are fed up with the state, with the empty promises of the state. With that, that nothing is working, that you cannot save because inflation destroys your money, and many evils that Argentina has been suffering. And the other thing that also I think goes in the direction that I'm telling you, the, camp the campaign of Millet was suicidal in the sense that he's, he told the truth absolutely. He never promised, he has not promised, vote for me and it will be milk and honey and you know, you'll, cha you'll change your car by the end of the year, and it's going to be great. No. He said, vote for me, I'm going to do what Argentina needs, eventually will be better, but it's going to be an extremely painful process because the country is this close to dying. So he was extremely, the, the metaphor of the, of the, of the chainsaw is, is, is that. He's saying, I have to cut everything because the situation is brutal. So I really think Millet is the emergent in a way. He, he's both like the catalyzer, but also the emergent of something that is way more profound than him and that is, uh, is showing a, a change in the society, a society that doesn't want the state anymore to be like the main driver of the economy, of, of everything, that wants to put the individual in the center. Millet René Campe saying, I want to be, become president to give power back to you. Uh, so that makes me extremely optimistic. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, according to his speeches in, uh, in Davos and in Mil Milken Institute in, in California, uh, I said that he's making a Copernican revolution in political, uh, maybe science in political world. And um, so the president in Argentina is very strong. So he has a power. But there is also a parliament and there he has no majority. How it happened that they vote for him for his crazy ideas? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah, I mean, he has, you know, like you said, I mean, not, not only he doesn't have a majority, he has a tiny minority. Just to give you an idea, in this, we have, you know, the, the House and the Senate. Uh, and in the Senate, he has seven senators out of 72, if I remember correctly. So it's really literally yeah. like nothing. Yeah. And in the, in the House, it's really a very small minority of, of members of parliament that he has there. In any case, uh, Millet and his government, even though some of them are, are more seasoned, uh, like people who have been in politics for quite some time, some of them are, are, are new. They are definitely going to make mistakes. They have made mistakes. Mistakes in the sense, I mean, the, where they want to want to go is very clear, and that you know that is, I think, what we have to ask of him. Uh, sometimes putting things into practice, they have made mistakes because they are relatively new. But in any case, Millet is is way more savvy than politically savvy than many people thought he would be. And by the way, what you mentioned that the so-called basis law that was approved uh, a couple of weeks ago is a major triumph of the government. Yeah. 
and, and this was done with a very small minority. How did it happen? How, how did it happen? Well, because firstly, the, the, the administration is, is, is extremely savvy. Secondly, Millet has an amazing popular support. The, the last six months in Argentina, Millet has been in office for a little bit over six months, have been very bad, in the sense extremely painful. Because just to give you an idea, Jan, uh, last year, the relative prices of the economy were so distorted that a pair of sneakers was more expensive than a month of rent in general because everything was so so you know put in order to that is you know it's something of course that must be done but it's brutal because it needs to it, it needs a change so yeah, yeah it, so it, it, it needs need, you know to so many things went up a lot you know well he's doing that he's doing that among other things and even though the process has been so painful, Millet's support, popular support, has not declined, not even one bit. And in fact, it has, he went, he came, arrived into office with huge popular support. It has not gone down and it has gone slightly up. So he has leveraged that very, uh, very, in a very clever way. To, to get the, the consensus that he needed to get these, these things approved. In any case, this law was approved six months after he went to office. This should have been approved five months ago, but uh, he has a, a, a difficult uh, opposition, particularly in, the Peron, in parts of the Peronist party that are more or less like a mafia-like party. That, that mm -hmm. is also the reality. Um, and it's not going to be easy for him. But he's doing a much better job. And, and with this, with the approval of this law, he really made very clear to everybody that he's in charge. He is in charge of Argentina. He is the one calling the shots. And people are definitely supporting him. OK, so uh, let's talk about this uh, popularity and this support, uh, because there is, he has a lot of enemies. All these parasites, I mean, the state employee who will be, who are fired, who, who will be fired. So they, for sure, they are against him, all the trade unions. How you see this, this balance? Yeah, that's a, de definitely, yeah. Yeah, there are a, a lot of, um, there is also a lot of uh, crony businessmen and women who are definitely not in favor of uh, opening the economy, of, of uh, competition, of free trade. Yes, there, um, there is a sector of the society that will fight him tooth and nail, and he has to be extremely careful. But he has a very clear mandate. Like I was telling you, he ran a campaign saying the truth all the time, saying that everything that he wanted to, to do, that he was going to do, not promising miracles, you know, at the, at the beginning or anything like that. And I think that what, what plays, there are a couple of things that play into, into his favor. The first one is something that, that, that you know, probably many people at the audience know, classical liberal reforms work. We know that. I mean, we know that they are they are painful many times. They are difficult to apply, but if you put them into practice, they work. But you know, in in such a country as as Poland, for example, we forget about this. So you know, when I was young, we also told about the real economy. We saw that the the Communist Party are lying. That you know, it does it does not fit what they are saying with the reality, and then. OK, we accepted the changes. The changes were not so, I, I would say, uh, the cut was not so evident as in Argentina because, you know, we mixed the, the former communist with the new government. So it was um, some kind of mist, I would say. And here <laughs> you, you have very clear cut. Uh, so uh, I think that the Argentinians, I am afraid that they may forget in maybe five, ten years about this classical laws of classical liberal economy. 
Well, you know, let's, <laughs> let's see in five or ten years. You know, give me ten years of Millet, and then we <laughs> okay, and then we will see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh, okay, are you proud of uh, of him? Are you proud to be Argentinian nowadays? Ah, uh, well, I'm, I'm proud of, of being Argentinian. You know, for many reasons, and also, I mean, it's not it's not a perfect country at all, but you know, it's my country, and, and I love it. Um, but I think uh, after there, there have been. Like, like I was telling you, there, there have been certain signs that Argentina's society is maturing. And it has cost us a lot. So it, please, I'm not saying, oh, yeah, we Argentinians are great or we're perfect or we're very intelligent. No, we have hit our, our heads against the wall, I think, in many times. But, you know, at, at least it seems it's been enough after, you know, the, the 100 times. Uh, it seems there are certain uh, things we, we have learned in 2000, Argentina uh, had, uh, as you know, a very big crisis uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. And that basically opened the door to extremely populist governments. And that was happening all across the region. Remember that Chavez was also in power in Venezuela, yeah, yeah. Evo Morales in, in, in Bolivia. So we had several. And we had the Kirchners in, in Argentina, who were basically people who wanted to to become some sort of the, the, the like the Ceausescu couple in, in Argentina, basically something something like that, like, like mm -hmm. the owners of the country. Uh, and Argentina was really aiming into that direction. And they were, Argentina started like a counter revolution against uh, populism in 2015. And it was the first country to defeat a populist government in the ballot, in the ballot box. That government, unfortunately, which was the Macri administration, that you know they could finish their their their, their term. Only, it was only four years because he, he couldn't be reelected. He lost. It was a failed experience in certain uh, in certain aspects, but it showed a lot of things. First, it showed that populism could be defeated. It's also, it showed that a non-Peronist government could rule because there was always this fear that, you know, non-Peronist governments, they don't, they don't even finish their term because mm -hmm. they are so bad. It, and that was already a, a, a show of, of hope. And I think we wouldn't have Millet today without that Macri, even though that Macri administration was, a, I think it was all in all, a failed experience, even though I, I totally supported it and, and, and I think it was the best could have happened at that time, but there, there, were, there was a lack of a re reform a zeal that the, 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 his government didn't, didn't have, unfortunately. But there were a lot of good lessons and bad lessons that allowed that Millet arrive into power now. And I think Millet learned a lot from that Macri administration not to make the same mistakes that, that uh, you know, from those mistakes not to make them again. Uh, so there is that. Uh, there are those signs, even though there, there have been things that have not gone well for a long time. Those things make me think that there is a there is a change in the society. And that, that is what, let's say, not, not to be proudful, but to be optimistic to think, hey, there, there might be something going on. And there might be finally people uh, wanting to put the individual at the center of the economy uh, and, and of the society. Uh, do you have uh, strong rela relations with Argentina, with your family living in Argentina? Yes, I do. I, I, still, I am still the president of a foundation there that I started 20 years ago and I have a big team working there. And, uh, so you, you know perfectly well what happens nowadays uh, in, a, in a normal life of ordinary people. Can you say something about this? What, how, how, uh, what kind of changes they see, they observe? Well, that's a very good question. There are many things. There has been a very difficult process, all this. Uh, the, 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 since Millet took office, I mean, the country was already in a very bad shape, but, you know, the, the kind of, of, of measures that the, the Millet government has been, uh, has been taking, they, they are absolutely necessary, but they have been also very painful. Uh, they were needed, but it was, uh, it was difficult. So that, um, that has been a rough 
you know, a rough time to, to go through. On the other hand, people, I, I come from a city that is called Rosario. Uh, Messi comes from that city, yeah, by yeah. the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Rosario had become extremely unsafe because of gang violence, drug-related crime. And I was talking today in the morning to a friend with a friend of mine who was there, and he was telling me that uh, it's not that Rosario has become completely safe, but it's evident that since particularly the national government said, hey, what is going on in Rosario is, uh, is in unacceptable. We're going to intervene. The situation has become much, much better. And let's say the climate for everything has improved. The cl people are now thinking of maybe I could open a, a business or I could do a small investment or I could do... The, everything is like, it's like a new scenario and everybody is expecting what new reforms and what, which new measures the, the government is going to put in place because they know they're going to facilitate economic activity. One of the things the government has for, uh, for the next uh, couple of, of, of weeks or months is a, a, a brutal debureaucratization of the economy. Argentina is full of regulations who are completely useless only for bureaucrats. Uh, the, the only, <laughs> they are the only ones who can benefit from them, but they only make life miserable for everybody who wants to do something Even in the country. Even for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the case in Poland. Indeed. Yeah. So they're going to cut all that. Uh, uh, so the, the, the climate and, and, and how people see the future this is something, sorry, I don't know if I'm replying to your question, but this is very important because I think this explains also why Millet won. The establishment in general, Argentina had become used to, and particularly from the political establishment, the only thing they were offering was to administer the decadence. Well, it's like, you know, yeah. impoverished. We, we will all be poorer and poorer, but it's going to be controlled. And basically, the Peronist party is that. It's basically, uh, it's basically a, a, a party that promises society, I'm going to keep the poor, the poor people in check, which are more and more and more every time. I'm going to keep them in check. I'll give them some circus and some bread. And I'm going to manage the decline, so it's, it's not that, that steep, and, and we can... And the opposition fell, basically, into the same... Uh, nobody... Many sectors of the political class, of media, became convinced that Argentina was beyond any kind of redemption. And that was... That, that was exactly what Millet detected and he was offering to totally the opposite. Millet was the only candidate who was offering a future that was different from the present. And that is also, I think that is, a, and not because he was saying we'll, we'll all be rich in, in four weeks or vote for me and everything is, uh, is going. No, but he was saying what, what you have been sold so far is, you know, just let's manage the decline. Vote for me. I'm going to do something that at the beginning is going to be very painful, but the country is going to heal and you'll be better. And your children will ha won't have to live if, if, if they don't want to. Your, you are going to live better than your parents. And that was a very much of the, let's say, of the secrets of, of, the, Millet, um, of the Millet victory. That finally there was somebody offering something that was different from the present. People were totally fed up. And uh, yeah, I, I think that was extremely important. Uh, okay, so now um, security, you already said that, uh, because in Poland, you know, the, uh, we have, uh, the, the gangs arose, for, uh, you know, after the, the transformation yeah. of political system, we have a period of five years, maybe even more. The Mokotowska. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have the fight of gangs and then very tragical situations, but now it's, it's okay. Uh, and what about um, what about uh, real estates? Uh, how it happens? Is it uh, is it interesting to invest nowadays in in Argentina to buy property? I am not a please. I'm not giving advice. You know, okay. I, I don't want anybody to sue me. I'll just give yeah. you my honest opinion, and you know, and, yeah. and then yeah, people yeah, yeah. should you know. Okay, so let's switch to media. Okay? No, no, but I can, <laughs> okay. I, can, I, can okay. I can happily tell you, but you know, I don't want anybody to sue me because then I. I um, 
Eh, I think Argentina... You can think many, you know, let's think many ways. Argent, Argentina is located quite far from everywhere in an area that is extremely peaceful. There are no conflict hypotheses between Argentina and Uruguay or Argentina and Brazil or between Brazil and Peru. You, you understand, or yeah, Chile yeah, yeah. and I don't know, and, 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 and Ecuador. So it's a very peaceful area, particularly in these times. Extremely peaceful. A, a place, I mean, very homogeneous in many ways, but many uh, but very diverse in others the whole of south america i would say but argentina in particular are countries that are used to having foreigners to receive to receive uh, migrants that have been quite open in the case of argentina in particular argentina is a country basically built by immigrants People from mostly Italy and Spain, but also from Poland and from Germany, other parts, yeah, yeah, from yeah. other parts of, of Europe. So there's that tradition. Argentina is quite open in that in that regard. We have a lot of problems. That xenophobia is not one of them. It's a nice country, and now is brutally cheap. So I would consider. A, Let's say, if end now with the possibility of entering into a cycle that will be very positive. So definitely uh, buying something in Argentina uh, or, or have some sort of uh, participation in what could happen in Argentina and hopefully will happen in Argentina, I think it's a, let's say... It's a scenario that, that people should consider. Does media change change nowadays? Or they still keep the narration of, of uh, Peronist and Kirchner, Kirchnerist? In general, you know, may, what, we would call, what we would call mainstream media is still very much pro-state. It's like you know, their, their first... Their first response to everything is more state, more regulation, and, and, and it's the fault of the free market, even though the free market doesn't exist. It doesn't matter, but, you know, it, it's always like that. The, other, the, the key question is how relevant is the media, who the media is talking to? Mm -hmm. Because if you, I mean, Millet was massacred during the campaign. He was massacred. By the media. Yeah, yeah he was portrayed as a maniac, as... A, S sexual deviator. Does, <laughs> that, that, does, does it, uh, does it, uh, is it as relevant? I think the, the media landscape has changed a lot. That is also a big misunderstanding that uh, mainstream media has about Millet, particularly uh, international mainstream media, because they, they, they do like the following analysis. Millet uh, doesn't uh, let's say he he's not in constant contact with media. He uses more direct channels such as uh, Twitter or social media in general. And he claims that that way he has a direct contact with the population. Therefore, he's a fascist because he is not using the the let's say the intermediary uh, the intermediary channels that uh, politicians used to, used to use. The problem is that the media landscape has changed. It's not that Millet is a fascist, it's that he can go to every TV show in, in, in the country and he's not going to be as, let's say, successful in reaching people as if he posts on social media. Because that is how everybody now, let's say, gets information, communicates, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Like I was telling you, his media participation in, in seven, six, seven years ago is not that they were very massively watched 
as they as uh, they happened on TV. It's just because then some guys made small clips and those clips got viral, and, and that mm -hmm. is what made Millet famous. Mm -hmm. The TV was just you know like a, a small stepping stone into into wide access to the population. So. That is the other thing. I think that the media, as we knew it, is, is becoming less and less relevant. Also, there are a, a lot of very good journalists, and there are also a lot of journalists that still don't understand why Millet won and the kind of ideas that Millet <laughs> represents. Eventually, they will find out, I hope. I mean, I hope for them. <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, you know, so... Uh, Messi is very well known all, all over the world. Uh, are there some links between politics and football and sport? I mean, you know, let's... That's a very good question. Yes, they, there are, of course. I think there shouldn't be. I think, you know, there are mm -hmm. two different... Uh, football, football in particular in Argentina is extremely important and... There, there has been, particularly with the, the previous administrations, the, the populist administrations, there were very blatant attempts to politicize football. They even, let's say, they nationalized the football broadcasting and they made it, it, it was unbearable to, to watch a match because they were talking all the time about the government. <laughs> there, there were no advertisement, <laughs> but the ones of the government, you couldn't, you couldn't even, let's suppose you, you went and you say, hey, I want to buy, you know, I want to buy time to, you know, put my, no, they wouldn't sell it to you. It was only for the government. So that was the, disgusting. Messi has given a lot of signs. I'm not saying that he's a Millet supporter, but he was definitely not a Kirchner supporter or, an, or, or Alberto Fernandez, who's the last he person. Has, uh, I think he has a common sense. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and many of the... And the national team, for instance, when the national team was a uh, world champion by the end of 2022, we still had the, the previous administration, which was Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Kirchner. And... They wanted to receive them when they arrived and, and, and get a photo opportunity, take them to the house of, of the president, and, and they refused. The national team refused. And so he has given very clear signals that he's not a populist or anything like that. But on the other hand, I wish I can see the day in which these things are completely different spheres. And, you know, let's say this is not a, we, we don't have to discuss whether Messi or whoever is, is for or against that on just, you know, president does his thing. Hopefully that's very little and leaves us alone. And, you know, Messi and, and his successors play football, hopefully score a lot of goals. And that's it. <laughs> okay. So now let's, um, uh, just to end our discussion, can you say something about uh, the Argentinians? You know, the, uh, how are they? Are they friendly? They like to, to, to sing, dance, <laughs> <laughs> make fiestas? Oh, well, we don't sing as, uh, and dance as, 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 you know, as, as, as Brazilians do. They're, they're much better at that. No, Argentina, I think, <clears throat> I mean, I'll, I'll try to be as objective as possible, but I think, you know, let me tell you a story. I think this, this tells a lot about the country, and, and it, it, this, is, this mm -hmm. is not only a very nice story, but it's also a true story. Uh, many years ago, when I was still living there, and I had a, a, a different a girlfriend at the time, a relationship well, who did not uh, came into fruition, but well, uh, this was many years ago, I was very young. Uh, my uh, girlfriend was part, or, and, and her sister were part of this uh, ex student exchange mm -hmm. organizations. And uh, there was a, a young boy, you know, all the, this was all for, for high school students, who had some issues at his original host family and ended up at the house of my girlfriend. This young boy was from uh, New Zealand. In New Zealand, he had, I would say, like two and a half friends at best, because he had one friend at school, one friend from his, uh, from his house. He lived like in a rural area, and that was basically it. And he was not very close with them. He stayed a little bit less than a year in Argentina. 
And he made friends in his school because he went to school, he studied. He was quite tall, so they suggested him to start playing basketball. He made friends at basketball. He made friends with the cousins of, of my girlfriend and, 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 and her sister. And he made friends with the friends of the, of the cousins. Mm -hmm. And he made friends with other people that he, that he met. When he was, the night, the last night that he spent in the country, uh, they did like some sort of celebration for him, some dinner, and then they took him out. And there were 50 guys outside, you know, like really like singing and, you know, and, and, and. so I think that's a, that's a very nice uh, story to show one of the nicest things about Argentina, which is it's a very open country. People open their, their, their houses to, to you. It's not that they need to know you for, you know, 15 years before <laughs> or, or things like that. People are, 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 I think, are quite open, quite friendly. It's a very open country. If you want to come to Argentina, you'll basically be considered Argentinian like in two weeks. Nobody will say, oh, no, but you're not from here or anything like that. In that regard, it's a, a, and many people from, from Europe and from other parts of the world really enjoy that. Many people always thought of Argentina like a nice place to retire or a nice place to, because really it's a, it's a very friendly atmosphere in that regard. The problem is that we have had a lot of other issues that made the country unbearable in many other ways, unfortunately. And let's say... Uh, Many of the problems that we had also deteriorated the social fabric. That is mm -hmm. also true, and, and, and hopefully those things will be will be solved. But in in the, let's say what I would like to highlight about about the country is that about the people is that people are are very warm and, and very open, and they will try to make you feel part very very soon. It's not you know the. the there are not that many high barriers between, mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. people. And I think that's a very nice feature of the country. Uh, so if someone asks you what to see in Argentina, so I personally advise him to go to El Chalten to see uh, Cerro Torre and uh, the second one, I forgot the name, the beautiest mountain in the world, uh, Cerro Torre Fitzroy, okay? And then go to um, Ushuaia to see Tierra del Fuego. What can you advise huh. more? Well, those are very good advices. Uh, well, it's, an, it's, it's a nice country, really. It has several things. The, 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 the whole Patagonia region is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it has lakes, it has mountains. It's, it's really beautiful. It's in the south of the country. You can go skiing in winter there, or you can go like hiking in, in summer. It's lovely. It's really nice. Uh, the city of Buenos Aires is quite beautiful. Uh, I'm not from Buenos Aires, I'm from Rosario, uh, but Buenos Aires is, is definitely a, a nice city. I also would really recommend like uh, the wine region, Mendoza, in particular by the Andes. Uh, the Andes is a very long chain of mountains uh, that divide Argentina, Argentina and Chile. It's lovely. The wine there is magnificent, by the way. So that, that is an end. Parts of the north, particularly Salta and Jujuy, uh, are, are really amazing. And then they have some landscapes that you don't see anywhere else in the world. Or I mean, you, you only see in that part of the world. You don't yeah. see in Europe. You don't see in other parts of America. You don't see in Africa. You don't see in Asia. It's so, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's a nice country. I always say, if you want to travel there, it's also quite big. It's not that well connected. Uh, so you have to select what you want to do because it's not that you say, hey, I'm going two weeks to Argentina, I'm going to do everything. No, it's not, yeah, no, yeah, it's it's not possible. possible. You yeah. have to decide, either focus in, in, in the center of the country or the south or, or the north, but there are a lot of things you can do. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting con conversation and I would like to invite you maybe next time after a couple of months of, of, uh, of uh, reforms of Milei and we will talk about this. And for, the, for now, thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for, for the invitation. And yeah, happy, happy to talk about Argentina and Millet. Okay, <laughs> thank you.